Hello and welcome again to Dean Wright Show. I hope you're all well. I hope you're all happy. I hope you're all fit and healthy. I hope you're all praying every day to the Lord God Almighty, keeping him close to your heart and in your mind. I hope that you're all doing some meditation. I hope that some of you might be drinking some distilled water. I hope that you're well in general and that your stress levels are manageable and you're not letting the negativity of this satanically run realm get to you. Stay with God, keep him in your heart and you'll always be strong. You'll always have ethics and you'll always have a moral compass as to what's wrong and what's right. They're all universal values. You don't have to be a holy, holy person to know what's right and what's wrong. And we all know what's right. And we all definitely know what's wrong. Just a quick one for you today. I thought it was quite interesting. A couple of days ago, I found out that Barack Obama, the ex-American president, who's not in office anymore, made a courtesy visit to the to the English British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. I think it was on Wednesday. They said it was a courtesy call. Well, if it was just a courtesy call, why is it in the, why is it all over the news? See, that's the real ruler of America coming to visit Rishi Sunak. Why else would he be there? That tells me everything about who's really running America right now. And he's doing it on behalf of his satanic paedophile masters. They're all in the same boat together. Biden, Obama, the Clintons, Boris Johnson, Theresa May, they're all in the same they're all in the same club. English, American, doesn't matter. Anybody around the world who's in, who has power at the moment, like Trudeau, they're all controlled and they're all satanic. It's as simple as that. Hello to all my new subscribers to the Dean Wright Show on whatever platform you're watching me on, whether that be Brighton, BitChute, Rumble, Odyssey, or last but not leastly, YouTube. Welcome to you all. Welcome to all my old subscribers and people who have been watching this show for the last few years. Thank you for your continued support. It really does mean a lot to me, guys. Thank you to all my emailers this week. I've had some um, interesting emails this week. I've had some great videos sent to me this week. I've had some um, messages of encouragement, which are always good. Always reminds me that there's a community out there. Uh, and that's what this channel is all about. We're not into giving you uh, convenient lies. This channel is all about giving you inconvenient truths. Because the inconvenient truths are what's really going on here. I don't think people really have a, an understanding of the amount of evil that's going on in this world right now. Right now, somewhere in the world, somebody's been murdered. Somebody's dying of a drug overdose. Somebody's going through an abortion. There are wars, counter wars. Right now, somebody is suffering. Right now, somebody's died. And that's exactly how Satan wants it. And we've got to fight back. And we've got to bring the values, the Christian values and morals and ethics back into our cultures because it has been slowly but surely ripped away. And also this week, on a, on a sad note, I received an email today from a, a good friend of mine uh, whose wife uh, is not well. And my prayers and thoughts go out to you and your family. Uh, at this tough time. My heart's with you. That's all I can say. So, let's move it on to... Yeah. Thank you to all my donators and channel supporters. Without your uh, little bits, your little donations that help keep the channel on the air, uh, it, it wouldn't be happening without you. The studio that I'm sitting in right now would not be here without generous, generous, generosity from channel supporters and donators. Like I say every week, the money that is given is given to the channel. It doesn't get spent on me. 
I'm low, low maintenance. And don't eat a lot, guys. Don't eat a lot. Don't drink. The only the only vice I have is marijuana. I like it. I like a joint. But I do my taekwondo, do my meditation, I drink my distilled water, I look after my partner. That's enough for me. Keep it simple, stupid, as we used to call it in the army, kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. That way, I can't make any mistakes. Because when I start juggling too many balls in the air, that's when I make mistakes. And it's taken me till the age of nearly 57 to work that one out. But hey, even the thickest ones among us get to get some realisation sooner or later. But if you would like to help support the channel, I do have a Give, Send, Go account and a PayPal account. Details for both of those pay portals will be in the description box below the video. Also, please like, share and subscribe. If you like the video, like it. If you think there's somebody that might uh, benefit from it, please share it. And if you like everything about it, please subscribe. Simple as that. So please like, share and subscribe to show it gets me up the algorithm and it keeps pushing me out there. I want to get to as many people as possible. Okay, so that's that out of the way. Now let's get to the housekeeping. I do the housekeeping every week. It sets the stall out for what what I believe in and what this channel is all about. This is more for the people who are watching this video for the first time. For those of you that have heard it all before and hear it every week, it's good to revise. It's always good to revise. And also, just one more thing before I start. The picture that you see uh, on the screen there, I bought this in a little town called Kakodi. And I saw this picture hanging up in a, it was like a, a council run arts program and it was hanging up by a couple of bits of string in a window. And I walked past there one day and uh, they, were t they were clearing the place out. And there was a lady there called Hazel and uh, I asked her about the picture and I said, is it for sales? And she went, yeah, but what do you want to give me for it? So she took me through the picture. She said she just literally cobbled it together with bits of masking tape and this, that and the other. It's a really big picture. I had to hang it up and put, put the, the uh, shade around it so I could uh, film it. Um, but it's so striking. It's a little kid saying, wake up, wake up. Because it's very poignant, this picture, because it's very powerful. Um, because it's their future that we're fighting for. It's their future that I'm worried about. Not mine. It's their future. It's their future indoctrination. It's their future uh, loss of freedoms. It's their future lack of knowledge of truth. That's what I'm fighting for. The kids' futures. So they don't have a dystopian future. That they have a bright and happy and hopeful future. And I think this image is very powerful because she basically just say, wake up. Well, anyway, I gave her, I gave her £40 for it. I mean, you could, you could have said, well, you know, it was a bit of this and a bit of that. It doesn't matter. I gave her what I, what I thought, you know, I could afford to give her. And she was, and she was very grateful for it. She just put, I think it's an amazing piece. I'm going to put it up in the house somewhere. But I want to get a T-shirt printed of it. Maybe get some T-shirts printed up. Let me know in the email. My email is in the description box below the video. Drop me an email and tell me if I should do, uh, do a black T-shirt with this on it. And they'll just sell them at cost price. Because I think it's a very powerful image. So let's get back to the housekeeping. So the housekeeping is this. We basically live on a flat and stationary realm. But we're not a flat and stationary realm in isolation, i.e. just as alone with the dome over the top. There is a dome around our continent system. But there are other dome systems beyond us. Now, this greater plane or pl we live on a planet it's a fraction or subsection of a much larger plane okay and I always show you this image at the beginning so we can get because the bigger image I'm going to show you we can never see it in its proper context so that's our known continent system here there's a 360 degree ice wall there's a sun and moon and there are other continents with other beings beyond the 360 degree ice wall this is the biggest picture of all this is the galaxy this is the universe the real universe, the real galaxy, with other planets on it. And the original definition, like I said, was a smaller subsection or fraction of a much larger plane. We live on a fraction or subsection 
of a much, that's a fractional subsection of a much larger plane. And that's us slap bang in the centre there. Okay, what I've just showed you there. All these other continents here have different civilizations. Aliens don't come from billions of light years away, living on little balls, spinning in a tent to the minus 17 tall vacuum, wandering aimlessly through space. No. They live on the same section or subsection of the larger plane. I think this plane could be a million miles across each way, quite easily. Yeah? They're our cousins, our neighbours, our nephews. Until they signed the Antarctic Treaty in 1959, we were allowed to come and go as we pleased, in and out of the 360, beyond the 360 degree ice wall. And also other, other civilizations were allowed to come in here now. The only aliens that are allowed to come in here now are the ones who are allowed to by Satan, who is, in my opinion, a Draco reptilian. They're in charge of this prison realm. We are slaves living in an apartheid system. When they signed the Antarctic Treaty in 1959, they basically had an apartheid system constructed against humanity. So we don't, we're cut off from everybody else and everybody else is cut off from us. And they've used that same model in South Africa and different places like that in years gone by. So it's an old, it's an old trick. It's an old system. It's nothing new here. Okay, and that's what they're doing to us. They believe that we're their property. When the only being that we truly belong to is the Lord God Almighty, because he's the one that created us. And he's the one that created this vast realm that you see right here. Even the evil ones were created by God. Some of them have been invented. Some, some beings like the, the, the alien greys, I think are biological entities that have been created. Slaves. But then you go back, if you read about Zachariah Sitchin's work and the Anunnaki, you said that they created us or helped make us what we are now. Is that true or not? I don't know. That would mean that they would see us as their property, of course. But that's true or not, I don't know. I think it's another side story. The only one true God is a true God who created us all and this realm. So they're our cousins, our neighbours, our nephews. And they all live on planets. Because the original definition of the word planet is a smaller subsection or fraction of a much larger plane. If you try and go to a thesaurus or anything like that, it's been taken out. You have to go to really old dictionaries to find the original. And these dictionaries, I tried to buy one, they're like up to 100 and odd pounds. I can't afford that. I can't afford it. So you'll just have to trust me on this one. This is a Kobayashi map. It's a thousand years old. It's ink drawn on cotton. Showing our 360 degree ice wall here with these other continents here that add up to 33. And that will come very relevant in a minute. There's a newspaper article about it. Was this world map made 10 centuries ago? Yes, it was. Otherwise, they wouldn't have drawn it, would they? It was hidden away in a, in a Buddhist monastery in Japan. Why was it hidden? Because it went against the narrative, the false narrative that was being sp spilled out by then about planets in space and 10 to the minus 17 tall vacuums and all that crap. UN flag, flat realm, 32 grids that look like prison bars and the center adds up to 33. Those represent the 33 of the continents around us that have a direct influence in this realm. That's what the true United Nations is. To the initiated, they know exactly what that means. The laurel leaves that encircle is a representation of our Draco reptilian overlords who run this prison realm. And this is how they're going to bring us to transhumanism and eventually, well, they are taking over. When that treaty gets signed, the World Health Organization treaty gets signed, that's it, it's going to be over for us. I tell you that right now. You've got the you've got the, the 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 medical needle here. You've got the reptilian showing themselves wrapping themselves around the needle because that's how they're going to take us from humans to transhumans. I've spoken about this before. That is Satan's end goal for humanity because when they get that, we will eventually be completely cut off from our divine higher selves. It's our divine higher selves that make us where the wisdom comes from, where our individuality comes from, where our 
perception and knowing of God comes from. And they want to eradicate that completely. Another uh, one I heard the other day, and I've done videos on it in the past, about birth rates dropping like stones to chemicals in the water, chemicals in the air and the food, sterilizing men, making women barren. That's what they reckon, is, a theory is that they reckon it's one of the reasons why there's so many of this illegal migration going on around the world, because they're having to fill up the amount of people that are going to drop, because fertility rates are dropping like a stone. And that's exactly where they want us. When we're unable to reproduce anymore, the state will step in and say, we shall now make the children. And they'll all have to be done. That's how they want complete control of us. If we allow it to happen, guys. Hitler knew that the Earth was a flat station realm. Here he is with his pencil pointing to New Schwabenland, the breakaway civilization that was formed in the 1930s with the help of his Draco reptilian overlords. The Allies found out about it and sent Admiral Byrd out there. I think it was in... They first went out there in 1945 with the SAS was sent out in 1945, got their asses kicked, sent Admiral Byrd out there with a fleet of 4,500 men, ships, helicopters, planes, everything. He got his ass kicked as well because apparently there was flying saucers coming out from under the ocean and they had to come back. When at the end of the Second World War, people say, oh, Hitler killed himself. Well, that was never proven. Then the counterclaim is that he lived out his life in Argentina. I've seen documentaries saying, witnesses saying they saw Hitler. I think that's a double bluff blind lie because I believe that Hitler spent out the rest of his days in New Schwabenland, where he's pointed to with his pencil there. If you're not supposed to be alive and you really don't want to be found... You wouldn't go and try and live your life out in Argentina because sooner or later somebody will get wind of where you are. So you go and live in a place that's not supposed to exist. In a region that's not supposed to exist. In a flat realm that's not supposed to exist. I keep wanting to show you, I'll do it in one of the next shows, there's a, there's a little meme about Hitler in 1972 coming over to England uh, because he was a bastard child of one of the Rothschilds and the Ill illegitimate son of King George V. And apparently uh, one of the royal family died and he attended the funeral and there's an image of him there. I keep me in show, but I can't find it. But I'll find it and show it you one day. So let's move on. Are there any images of any, any other beings that we might have met? Well, here's some here. Whether it, this gentleman here has gone beyond the 360 degree ice wall to say hello to his probably a good friend of his but they look quite friendly with each other. All this being has come to our realm, we don't know. This one's a bit more dramatic, but the variation's on the same theme. Two eyes, two ears, a nose, two hands, two feet, a bumhole, genitals. Variations on the same theme. This is my favourite one because I like the suit this uh, being is wearing here. One, two, three, four. It's got six fingers, or oh, it looks like five. Very tall, elongated face. But like I say, it looked like they're having a nice cup of tea and a chat with each other. There were books written before the uh, Antarctic Treaty deal was signed. People, one guy sold his business, bought a ship, put a crew together, went beyond the 360 degree ice wall and met another side of civilization in the Iron Republic. And he written a book about it in 1902 by Richard Jameson Morgan. You can buy this book on Amazon. Another one, Worlds Beyond the Poles, F. Amandeo Giannini. It can also be bought on Amazon. Buy the books, they're not expensive. And get some first-hand and first witness testimony. Is there any evidence that we're ruled by a being that is immortal and has been around for thousands of years. Well, yes, there is. Man discovers extra terrestrial coin. Now, the only beings that get put on coins and money are very important people. Abraham Lincoln, the Queen of England, the King of England, King, Queens, Presidents, whatever. They get the heads on the money. This being was a very important being. It's probably still alive today and running this realm. It says Liberty on it, 1937. So obviously this coin was being minted in the same place as ordinary money for this realm was being printed. And this got left behind and contaminated a batch of coins that was for this realm. That's how it got in. So they're printing money for this realm and all the other realms that they own. 
Why wouldn't you do that? That being's in charge. Is that being Satan? I don't know. I'm just trying to find clues and come up with a logical explanation. Is there any other proof? Yeah, this coin is a lot older. It's got Greek writing on it. Looks like the same beam to me. That is just a more modern version of that depiction there. That is the same being. Is that Satan? I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. But I'm just looking at proof for the, you know, for the, for the, the fact that we're run by, by a, a being, an immortal being who's very intelligent, loves long-term planning, and hates humanity. That's all I know. Because all the stuff that these little errand boy Freemasons are running around, your Barack Obamas, your Clintons, your Boris Johnson, all these people, yeah, all these high-ranking Freemasons and Satanists are running around doing his bidding. So let's move on. This channel is not into telling you comforting lies. I'm into telling you truths. And if you personally find some of the truths that I tell you unpleasant, deal with it. Deal with it. That's how you open your consciousness. That's how you broaden your horizons. A lot of the stuff here, I don't like, you know, it's is, is not pleasant. But unfortunately, we live in an unpleasant place run by unpleasant beings who want to do unpleasant things to us. And we need to wake up. So, let's move on to tonight's show. Flat Earth... And the Son of God. Not the S-O-N of God. We know who that is. I'm talking about the Son. S-U-N of God. Because the Son was created along with the moon and everything else in here. And how it's symbiotic with us. And it's so important to us. We see it most days in our lives. And we take it for granted. But we're only told one side of the story about what the Son is really. It's an electromagnetic energy source and we're electromagnetic beings and we need the sun to be healthy. And I think there's supposed to be, on the 8th of April, there's going to be a total solar eclipse which is going to go across America on the 8th of April of this year. And a lot of people in the East Tech world are saying it's very important or portends to certain things that are going to happen. Some important is going to happen. I think the reason why they use chemtrails to poison us, but it's also used to block the sun out, to stop its radiance from us evolving. That's what I believe. The sun goes through phases, and we, in turn, go through phases with it. Because we're the SONs and daughters of God, we're the sons and daughters of God, but this is the son of God, and it's for everybody's benefit. The powers that be know that, and that's why they're trying to stop us getting the benefits like wearing sunglasses. Don't wear sunglasses. It cuts out the UV rays. It's all the stuff that's good for us. Same as sunblock. That's got carcinogens, uh, in, carcinogens in them. Don't, put, don't use suntan lotion. Because they don't want you to benefit from the sun. So that's what we're going to look at this week. Here's the sun. Beautiful. I've done loads of videos. This crepuscular rays there. Every day we see it. That's false. That's not real. That's real. Beautiful. The sun is an amazing God-given gift to us all. That benefits us all. But let's have a look at Wikipedia and see what they have to say about the sun. Let's have a laugh and look at the lies that they tell about the sun. So, here we go. Quote. The sun is the star at the centre of the solar system. It is a massive hot ball of plasma inflated and heated by energy produced by nuclear fusion. Lies. Reac reactions at its core. Part of this energy is emitted from its surface as light, ultraviolet and infrared radiation. Providing most of the energy for life on Earth, the sun has been an object of veneration in many cultures. It has been a central subject for astronomical research since ancient times. The sun orbits the galactic centre at a distance of 26 Point six six, see it? Six 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 light years from Earth. It is on average one AU, one point four nine times ten to the power eight kilometers, or about eight light minutes away. Its diameter is about one thousand three one million three hundred ninety one thousand four hundred kilometers. One hundred times 
that of Earth. Its mass is about 330 times that of Earth. These are three threes again. Making up about 99.86%. And there you go, you've got another three sixes. Turn the two nines upside down, 0. 0.8, and there's your third six there. Of the total mass of the solar system, roughly three quarters of the sun's mass consists of hydrogen, minus 73%. The rest is mostly helium, with much smaller quantities of heavy elements, including oxygen, carbon, neon, and iron. We all know it's a load of lies, so I'm not even going to bother. But let's have a look at some more lies. Let's have a look at what... This is what they tell us it looks like. This here... At the core, this is what they tell us the sun looks like. It's an absolute lie. But let's just read the first paragraph before it makes me feel ill. Quote, the core of the sun extends from the centre to about 20 to 25 percent of the solar radius. It has a density of up to 150 grams centimetres squared, about 150 times the density of water, and a temperature of close to 5 15.7 million Kelvin. By contrast, the sun's surface temperature is about 5,800 Kelvin. Recent analysis of SOHO mission data favours a faster rotation rate in the core than in the radiative zone above. Though much of the sun's uh, life energy has been produced by nuclear fusion in the core region through the proton-proton chain. This process converts hydrogen into helium. Currently, only 0.8% of the energy generated in the sun comes from another sequence of fusion reactions called the CNO cycle. Though this proportion is expected to increase, the sun becomes older and more luminous. I mean, I know it's a load of bullshit. You know it's a load of bullshit, but you have to sort of take your hat off them really a little bit because it's such a fantastically crafted lie that over the years, because people have had to buy into it and get the PhDs and all that, right, they've elaborated on it and elaborated on it and elaborated on it and elaborated until it's become this huge gargantuan Stinking dung heap, steaming in the midday sun of truth. Right, so let's have a look at it more interesting, the religious aspect of what the sun has always meant to all of us. It's, it's so integral to our being, because without it, we're dead. Quote, Solar deities play a major role in many world religions and mythologies. Worship of the sun was central to civilizations such as the ancient Egyptians, the Inca of South America and the Aztecs of what is now Mexico. In religions such as Hinduism, the sun is still considered a god, known as Surya. Many ancient monuments were constructed with solar phenomena in mind. For example, stone megaliths accurately mark the summer or winter solstice. For example, in Napta Playa, Egypt, Minjandra in Malta and Stonehenge, England, Newgrange, a prehistoric built mound in Ireland, was designed to detect the winter solstice. The Pyramid of El Castillo at Chichen Itza, where I've been to, in Mexico, is designed to cast shadows in the shape of serpents climbing down the pyramid at the, ver at the vernal and autumnal equinoxes. The ancient Sumerians believed that the sun was Utu, excuse me, the god of justice and twin brother of Inanna, the Queen of Heaven, who was identified as the planet Venus. Later, Utu was identified with the East Semitic god Shamash. Utu was regarded as a helper deity who aided those in distress. From at least the fourth dynasty of ancient Egypt, the sun was worshipped as the sun god Ra, portrayed as a falcon-headed divinity surmounted, surmounted by the solar disk and surrounded by a serpent. In the New Empire period, the sun became identified with the dung beetle in the form of the sun disk Aten. The sun had a brief resurgence during the Amarna period when it became the preeminent, if not only, divinity for the pharaoh Akhenaten. And some people say that Barack Obama is a clone of Akhenaten. Have you ever seen images of Akhenaten and Barack Obama's face? Uncanny. The Egyptians portrayed the god Ra as being carried across the sky in a cell of a barge, accompanied by lesser gods, and to the Greeks he was Helios, carried by a chariot drawn by fiery horses. From the reign of Il Ilabalus in the late Roman Empire, the sun's birthday was a, hol was a holiday celebrated as Sol Invictus, literally unconquered sun. Soon after the winter solstice, which may have been an, anti an antecedent to Christmas, Regarding the fixed stars, the sun appears from Earth to revolve once a year along the ecliptic through the zodiac. And so Greek ast astronomers categorised it as one of the seven planets. The naming of the days of the weeks after the seven planets dates to the Roman era. Excuse me. In Proto-Indo-European religion, the sun was personified as the goddess Se. Derivatives of this goddess in Indo-European languages include the Old Norse, Sanskrit, Surya, Gulish, Lithuanian, Sul, and Slavic, Sionitz, 
In ancient Greek religion, the sun deity was the male god Helios, who in later times was syncretized with Apollo. In the Bible, Malachi 4.2 mentions the son of righteousness, sometimes translated as son of justice, which some Christians have interpreted as a reference to the Messiah. In ancient Roman culture, Sunday was a day of, su- of the sun god. In paganism, the sun was a source of life, given warmth and, warmth and illumination. It was the centre of a popular cult among Romans who, sh- who would stand at dawn to catch the first rays of sunshine as they prayed. It's called sun gazing, and we're going to look at it and how to do it. Uh, the celebration of the winter solstice which influenced Christmas was part of the Roman cult of the unconquered sun it was adopted as a Sabbath day by Christians the symbol of light was a pagan device adopted by Christians and perhaps the most important one that did not come from Jewish traditions Christian churches were, were built so that the congregation faced towards the sunrise Tonatiu, the Aztec god of the sun, was closely associated with the practice of human sacrifice. The sun goddess Amaratsu is the most important deity in the Shinto religion, and she's believed to be the direct ancestor of all Japanese em- emperors. Now, I'm just going to look at this observation by eyes at the sun. They're going to warn you off it, basically, in this. So we'll have a quick read of this, because we're going to look at sun gazing, and we're going to look at the, some of the practitioners of sun gazing. Because as well as looking at the sun, we can also look at practical ways to benefit from the sun. I've started doing sun gazing now, every time it's out, and it's very powerful. It's very powerful. Now, I've looked at it in, in, in the height of the daytime. Because we're going to look at when they say sunrise and sunset and what sunrise and sunset really is on a flat and stationary plane. Okay, so let's have a look at this. The brightness of the sun can cause pain from looking at it with the naked eye, not to meet him. However, doing so for brief periods is not hazardous for non diluted dilated eyes looking directly at the sun sun gazing causes phosphine visual effects and temporary partial blindness didn't for me it also delivers about four milliwatts of sunlight to the retina slightly heating it and potentially causing damage in eyes that cannot respond properly to the brightness viewing of the direct sun with the naked eye can cause uv induced sunburn like lesions on the retina beginning beginning after about 100 seconds didn't to me particularly under conditions where the uv light from the sun is intense and well focused didn't to me. Viewing the sun through light concentrating optics such as binoculars may result in permanent damage to the retina without an appropriate filter that blocks UV and substantially dims the sunlight. When using a, uh, an attenuating filter to view the sun, the viewer is cautioned to use a filter specifically designed for that use. Some improvised filters that uh, pass UV or IR rays can actually harm the eye at high brightness levels. Brief glances at the midday sun through an unfiltered telescope can cause permanent damage. During sunrise and sunset, sunlight is attenuated because of the Rayleigh scattering and mild scattering from a particularly long passage through Earth's atmosphere. And the sun is sometimes faint enough to be viewed comfortably with the naked eye or safely with optics. Uh, hazy conditions, atmospheric dust and high humidity contribute to the atmospheric attenuation. An optical phenomenon known as green flash can sometimes be seen shortly after sunset or before sunrise. The flash is caused by the light from the sun just below the horizon being bent, usually through a temperature inversion towards the observer. Light or shorter wavelengths, violet, blue or green, is bent more than that of longer wavelengths, yellow, orange or red. But the violet and blue light is scattered more, leaving light that is perceived as green. So we'll come out of that, load of nonsense. And we're going to go to Professor Eric Dollard, who has studied the sun for years, and he's going to tell you right now exactly what it is. Hopefully. There's no inside structure. Is it all? Yeah, there's only a surface. There's nothing inside. Is the sun actually the Busting it out it's not burning anything. There's no fusion in the sun. That's well understood. Prove it. Yeah, well, there's just not the way to prove that there is any. It's only in the flares that you get fusion. That's why all the X-rays, the flares, the arcs, and the X-rays, and the microwaves, and whatever result of fusion in the arcs. Since there's no fusion in the sun. They don't know how the sun works. Why do you... What's special? How does the sun make light? It's a transform. Transforms from some other dimension. It's not burning anything. It doesn't have to. It's a converter. Of what? I don't know. Nobody knows. But that's what it does. That's the only thing it can do because that's how everything works. Transforming from another dimension. 
Yeah, you could say it's taking energy from another dimension, counter space. There, I mean, there's no energy, actually. You can't, most of it you can't even measure in outer space or see. Can't see. No, you can't see the sun in free space. So the sun is not visible in outer space. Not in free space. It's only invisible when gross matter becomes involved, like the Earth's atmosphere and envelope and the surface of the moon. Or Hear what he said? Atmosphere and envelope. What is an envelope? It's the firmament over the top. He knows the Earth's flat. Whatever, that makes the light. Otherwise, there is no light. You can see the moon, you can see the Earth, but you can't see the sun or you can't see the stars. But you can see the planets and yeah, the satellites. Right, you can see material objects, but you cannot see the sources of light. There is no light until there's a material object. To reflect on. So that means there's no time delay. See? So the whole time delay thing is, is meaningless. It doesn't take light years. There are no light years. There are no light years because the sun is within the firmament and it's only a few thousand miles away from us, travelling at a thousand miles an hour. That's why there's no time delay. It's instant. Because there's no light. So that, does, that means that the light you see from the distant stars isn't four million years old. Exactly. It could be only minutes old. Exactly. It could be instantaneous. Exactly. All the theories collapse when you can't see the stars in outer space. Exactly. Thank you very much, Mr. Eric Dollard. I remember watching that video, that original uh, one, oh, about eight years ago. Right, let's have a look at how the sun and moon work on the flat and stationary realm. I'm going to leave this down to Mr. The King of all Flat Earthers and the guy who brought me to the Flat Earth reality of this realm, Mr. Eric Dubay. Flat Earth model. The sun and moon spotlights are perpetually hovering over and parallel to the surface of the Earth. From our vantage point, due to the law of perspective, the two luminaries appear to rise up the eastern horizon, reach their peaks high overhead, <coughs> and then sink below the western horizon. They do not escape to the underside of the flat earth, as scoffing detractors often imagine, but rather rotate concentric clockwise circles around the circumference from tropic to tropic. The appearance of rising, peaking, and setting is due to the common law of perspective, where tall objects appear high overhead when nearby, but at a distance gradually lower towards the vanishing point. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, Although the sun is at all times above and parallel to the Earth's surface, he appears to ascend the firmament from morning until noon, and to descend and sink below the horizon at evening. This arises from a simple and everywhere visible law of perspective. A flock of birds, when passing over a flat or marshy country, always appears to descend as it recedes, and if the flock is extensive, the first bird appears <coughs> lower or nearer to the horizon than the last. The farthest light in a row of lamps appears the lowest, although each one has the same altitude. Bearing these phenomena in mind, it will easily be seen how the sun, although always parallel to the surface of the earth, must appear to ascend when approaching, and descend after leaving the meridian or noonday position. What can be more common than the observation that, standing at one end of a long row of lamp posts, those nearest to us seem to be the highest, and those farthest away the lowest, whilst, as we move along towards the opposite end of the series, those which we approach seem to get higher, and those we are leaving behind appear to gradually become lower. It is an ordinary effect of perspective for an object to appear lower and lower as the observer goes farther and farther away from it. Let anyone try the experiment of looking at a lighthouse, church spire, monument, gas lamp, or other elevated object from a distance of only a few <coughs> yards and notice the angle at which it is observed. On going farther away, the angle under which it is seen will diminish and the object will appear lower and lower as the distance of the observer increases, until, at a certain point, the line of sight to the object and the apparently uprising surface of the earth upon or over which it stands will converge to the angle which constitutes the vanishing point, or the horizon, beyond which it will be invisible. Globe defenders will often insist this explanation incorrect and challenge flat earthers that if the sun has simply disappeared due to perspective, then a good zoom camera 
should be able to bring it back into full view after it is set, just like with ships disappearing beyond the horizon. In reality, zooming a ship back into view from a few miles away is much different than bringing the sun back from over 3,000 miles away. Furthermore, ships are usually traveling only a few miles per hour, while the sun travels over a thousand miles per hour. So the window of opportunity to attempt this experiment is only a few minutes. First, wait until the sun has half disappeared beneath the horizon so that you can only see the top half and are satisfied that the bottom half is no longer visible. Next, using a camera with adequate magnification capability. So just quickly, the sun is traveling away from you so it's angular size reduction. So you've got that vanishing point in the center. So it looks as though it's going away from you. Same as when it's coming towards you. It's getting larger and larger and larger. It's not coming from the underside of the earth and coming up around us. It's getting nearer to you. So it's angular size reduction increases. You do it with your hand in front of you. Put your hand up to your eyes and pull it away. It gets smaller. That's it. Everything's very simple on God's created flat station realm. It doesn't have to be complicated, because truth's not complicated, it's very simple. By zooming into the half-set sun, you will be able to bring the entire sun back <clears throat> into full view. Then, as you zoom in and out, the sun will appear to rise above and sink below the horizon, often with a significant portion of sky reappearing beneath the sun, proving beyond any shadow of doubt that the sun is simply moving away from your position and not physically falling beneath the curvature of a globe. Heliocentrists would have you believe the very opposite of what every human who has ever walked the earth has seen with their own eyes. Satanists would have you it believe. It is obvious to any child and sovereign-minded adult that the sun, moon, stars, and planets, every light in the sky above, revolves over and around the motionless earth beneath our feet. It is also plain to see that the sun and moon are both approximately the same size and situated relatively close to Earth, not 400 times divergent and not millions upon millions of miles away. To abandon your senses and everyday experience in favor of such unfounded science fiction <coughs> fantasies is a fallacy of appeal to authority so extreme that it leaves the brainwashed believer impotent to trust his own natural instincts and forever thereafter, chained to the fantastical explanations of astronomical charlatans. Need I say any more? Eric DeBay is the man. Go to his YouTube channel, go and look at some of his videos. He was the, uh, one of the original uh, pioneers of the Flat Earth Truth. Now, this is a video that I did, uh, I can't remember, I think it was last year, I put it up. Um, this is where I went down to Kirkcaldy. Now, just to quick warn you quickly, um, there's a lot of wind in this video. So, uh, and it sort of blows. Can you hear it? Well, it's either talk you through it or I'll just, let, or just let the video play. We'll see how we get on anyway. If it gets too uh, windy, I'll just set the, the volume off and I'll talk you through it. So this is me down in Kirkcaldy. Hi there, people. Just down on the beach here today. As you can see, I'll just come back. Coastline, which is 22 miles away, but I'm not here to do that. Just want to show you why I was here. I'm here to focus on this. Now, this light source within the cloud base is just focusing on this. There's the sun. There's the sun <coughs> moving through the cloud base. Now, how can the sun be 93 million miles away? Yet here, you can see it moving through the cloud base. You can see the clouds in front, but you can also see the clouds behind. 93 million miles away. I don't think so, guys. Let's just focus in a bit more on that. Look at this. It's surrounded by the <coughs> cloud base. It's moving through the cloud base. You can see it right here. 
let's just pan back and get some perspective on this. Yeah, there's the beach below, and then we're going to zoom back in. in front of it as it's moving through it and you can see the clouds behind it let's just zoom in again <coughs> the sun moving through the clouds there's your evidence there's your proof Folks, Sorry about the noise in the background there, but it's one of them, probably one of the most important videos I think I've ever done. To be quite honest with you, um, it's it's just nailed on proof that we, you know, that the sun is local. I mean, what more evidence do I need to show you? I don't think so. And it was funny when I went down to the beach today with the dog. It was overcast. And I thought, I'll take my camera. Someone told me to take my camera. So I took it. And then someone said to me, take it onto the beach because I was going to leave it in the car. So we bent for the walk up the beach and we we're coming back. It wasn't until I climbed up through the rocks to get back to the car that I saw this. And lo and behold, I got it. And I think it's one of the most important videos I've ever done. It's absolute slam dunk evidence that the sun is local. And that we live on a flat and stationary plane. Okay, so let's move on to other proofs that, that we live on a flat and stationary plane with the sun. These are called sun dogs, and it's shown you the firmament above us, and this is the reflection off the sides of the firmament. Crepuscular rays that only come from a local light source. If the sun was supposed to be 93 million miles away, then the light was supposed to be coming to Earth. Lev uh, all, all, all at the same time the speed of light you wouldn't get localised uh, light sources like we've got here that proves it's like a, it's putting a table lamp on in the dark in your house it's a localised light source that's why you've got that intensity crepuscular rays prove the sun is local how else would that happen Yet yeah, people, everyday people look at it and don't bat an eyelid or actually, you know, for one second go, hmm, that's not supposed to be how it's supposed to be. That's how conditioned people's minds are. Not to question anything, not to do any critical thinking, not to think for themselves, just to repeat what they've been told and indoctrinated with. So let's move on to two sons. There's video out there of two sons in our system or could it be a sun from another system that went but, but, but they cross at the same at certain times of the year let's have a look at this now i'm going to take this video forward because it just shows you the one sun but in a few seconds in it will show you the uh, second sun they both pop out at the bottom of this cloud base here so let's have a watch of this Under the screen there.
tell it's two separate light sources because look, these rays that come off show the singularity of the light source. That's doing exactly the same as that, so it's a separate light source to this one. I mean, you can go on to Google and just tap in uh, two suns and there's loads of images. It's quite a common thing. It's not an uncommon thing that you're looking at. Now, is that the sun from a, from another realm? Who knows? But there's two there for sure. So let's come out of that and move on to the next one. This one here shows you four suns in the sky. So let's have a play of this. Four of them. How's that possible? Could they be reflections from the one main one? I don't know. I'm not sure. One seems pretty solid and there's another three there. Does that obviously seem more distant away? Are they from other realms? Could it be like a, a once in a lifetime thing where they're all converging at the same time? I don't know. I'm speculating. But there's evidence there of four suns. See, there's so much we don't know about our realm. The, the magical side of it, the esoteric side of it, where you said, you know, we live in a magical realm, but we're led to believe it's just a material realm. Well, there's a lot more to it, guys. And we have all the, all the potential to, to uh, interact with this ether, the energy that's around us all the time that we're breathing in. We have to completely scrap what we've been told reality is. About who we are, where we are, and what we are. We need to wipe the slate clean and start again. That's how comprehensive the brain programming has been done to us. So that's four suns in the sky there. So let's move on to, there's quite a few videos tonight, the symbolism of the sun and what it actually means. So let's have a listen to this. Its radiance is unparalleled, and compared to the ever-changing moon, its powerful shine is constant. It's the daytime star and the luminary that's given the most attention, and understandably so. Many cultures have equated the sun with God, the sun of God, Absolutely. sometimes the eye of God. The rays of the sun project, which complements the moon's receptive nature. The brilliance of the sun makes it a natural symbolic metaphor for a number of ideas, from positivity to enlightenment, and even life itself. The departure it of the is part of, the of sun that. has been the inspiration of countless festivals and ceremonies for ages. Various myths encode the cycles of the sun. It's not uncommon for tribes to develop rituals intended to appease, attract, or even repel solar energy. Fire is often used as well, which reminds us of the heat of the sun. The sun, or lack thereof, radically changes the physical and cultural climate of a region. Solar cults and religions have existed in all shapes and sizes. Solar energy is connected to gold, while lunar energy is aligned with silver. The Aztecs considered gold to be the excrement of the sun god. It's also been called the sun of earth and is the king of precious metals. The alchemical tradition gives us the concept of turning lead into gold. There's ether there, A E R ether. The sun is of primary importance in astrology. The solar pathway called the ecliptic dictates which constellations are part of the zodiac. Asking for someone's sign is shorthand for wanting to know their sun sign. As such, it makes sense that some astrological wheels put the sun in the center. The spoken <coughs> wheel parallel the rays of the sun, and the two have long been associated with each other. The power of the sun can also blind and burn. It can turn a lush landscape into a dry wasteland. The sun, for all of its life-giving glory, also plays the role of destroyer. Desert cultures know this all too well. In fact, there's an older tradition that links the underworld with summer, the time of Leo. Regarding Babylonian tradition, Gavin White writes, In a seasonal context, the line expresses the solar power unleashed over high summer, which causes death and drought. There's also the mystery of the black sun and its many interpretations. In one aspect, it's believed the visible sun is connected to the material plane, while a black sun is linked with the spiritual. There's mm -hmm. a history that associates the black sun with Rahu of the Vedic tradition, or what we call the North Node in Western astrology. In alchemy, the black sun is sometimes linked with the process of negretto, or blackness, which means putrefaction or decomposition. There's theories that promote the idea of a central black sun residing in the middle of the known universe. There's also the esoteric order of the black sun. The order is often linked to Saturn, 
which corresponds with the color black. And according to authors like Emmanuel Velikovsky, Saturn was once the ancient son of Earth. Notice the similarities between Saturn no, and the Saturn is a continent system beyond the 360 the degree. It's bullshit and alert. The in the sky, its tremendous influence is nearly unmatched. So much so that this exploration of its meaning barely scratches. So we'll leave it at that for that video. So there's a, a, just a little insight into the symbolism of the sun. Let's have a look at the spiritual side of the sun. Soulful radiance, exploring the spiritual aspects of the sun and solar practices. In the tapestry of spiritual exploration, the sun stands as a beacon of divine brilliance, offering not only physical sustenance, but also profound spiritual insights. This blog delves into the spiritual dimensions of the sun and introduces various solar practices that connect seekers with the radiant energies of our celestial luminary, the sun as a spiritual symbol. Because it's part of us. It's here for a reason. It gives us life. It's part of us. It's divinely created the same as us. Across cultures and epochs, the sun has been revered as a symbol of divinity, enlightenment and cosmic consciousness. In spiritual traditions, it often serves as a metaphor for the higher self, illuminating the path to inner wisdom and awakening. The sun's life-given energy and its unceasing journey through the sky have inspired awe and contemplation, inviting us to explore the deeper <clears throat> metaphysical aspects of our existence. Solar practices for spiritual connection, sun gazing meditation. We're going to read on it here, but we're going to look at it, how to do it, and look at some of the practitioners and proof of its benefits. Sun gazing meditation, one of the ancient practices associated with solar spirituality is sun gazing. Advocates believe that the sun at the sun during specific safe hours can have transformative effects on consciousness. This meditative practice is thought to enhance intuition, balance the pineal gland and align the pra practitioner with the sun's spiritual energy. Solar rituals and ceremonies. Many spiritual traditions incorporate solar rituals and ceremonies to honour the sun's life-affirming energy. These practices often involve performing sun salutations, expressing gratitude for the light that sustains a life on earth. The rhythmic movements in sun salutations are not only physical exercises, but also symbolic gestures of reverence and alignment. Solar bathing and energy absorption, because there's energy in the air around you in the ether. Engaging in sunbathing or absorbing sunlight consciously is considered a form of energy healing in some spiritual practices. This involves exposing oneself to sunlight with the intention of absorbing its revitalizing energy, fostering a sense of well-being and spiritual nourishment. Solar astrology and sun signs. In astrology, the sun represents the core essence of an individual's identity. Sun signs are believed <coughs> to influence personality traits and characteristics. Exploring one's sun sign in depth can be a gateway to understanding aspects of the self on a spiritual level providing insights into the soul's journey and purpose in this lifetime. Solar festivals and celebrations. Various cultures celebrate solar festivals that mark key moments in the sun's journey, such as solstices and equinoxes, excuse me. These celebrations often involve rituals, ceremonies and communal gatherings to honor the cosmic dance of light and darkness. Participating in these events fosters a sense of connection with the natural rhythms of the universe. The spiritual significance of solar eclipses, one's coming on the 8th of April, and it's going straight across middle America. Solar eclipses, where the moon briefly obscures the sun, hold unique spiritual significance. In many spiritual traditions, eclipses are seen as potent, potent moments for inner reflection, release, and transformation. The alignment of celestial bodies during an eclipse is believed to amplify energies that facilitate spiritual growth and evolution. As we navigate our spiritual journeys, the sun stands as a constant companion, inviting us to explore its death beyond its physical radiance. Engaging in solar practices allows us to tap into the spiritual essence of the sun, fostering a profound connection with our higher selves and the cosmic energies that guide us on the path to enlightenment. May we bask in the soulful radiance of the sun, embracing its wisdom and illumination as we continue our journey of self-discovery and spiritual evolution. Yep. So let's have a look at sun gazing and how it works because what we're looking at tonight and then we go right <clears throat> what I'm trying to do in my videos is try and find a um, a practical self-help way like I did with the, the previous videos finding exercises and practical things that we can do in our lives to help ourselves 
as that. Not some. When I was a monk, sometimes you'd listen to these lamas would come over and give you teachings in retreat. And they'd be, you know, talking about the Vajrayana and Tantrism and all this. And it, it'd go off on this, like, very oity toity way of teaching things. And it's very complicated. And, you know, it, 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 it's really hard to grasp what it's trying to teach you because it's all flowered up and stuff like that. But when it comes to practical things, like meditation is very simple. That's why I do it. It's simple, but you can grow it by doing nothing. But it's very hard to do no thing. A great Zen teacher was once asked by a, a, a guy who wanted to be taught by him. The guy said to him, the, the wannabe student said to the, to the master, the Zen master, he said, uh, what can you teach me? And he said, nothing. But what he meant to say was no thing, which is what meditation is. No thing. So let's have a look at Sungays in the practical ways that we can benefit from it. So let's just turn the, uh, the music off and have a listen to this. Sungays in a brighter perspective. Have you ever paused to ponder the benefits of sun gazing? It might seem like an unusual concept, but sun gazing the practice of looking directly at the sun for short periods of time, usually at sunrise or sunset, has been a part of many cultures around the world for centuries. One of the most profound benefits of sun gazing is the potential for improved mental health. The bright light of the sun can stimulate the production of serotonin and melatonin in our brains. These are two crucial neurotransmitters responsible for maintaining our mood and sleep patterns. Increased levels of serotonin can help ward off depression and anxiety, while melatonin helps regulate our sleep, ensuring we are well rested and rejuvenated. Now, imagine the sun as a natural, vast source of light energy. By sun gazing, some people believe they can tap into this energy, absorbing it into their bodies and using it to invigorate themselves. While this might sound a bit mystical, there's no denying the sense of calm and peace that comes from spending a few quiet moments with the rising or setting sun. A third benefit of sun gazing is the potential for enhanced eyesight. This might sound counterintuitive, as we're often cautioned against looking directly at the sun. However, because when they don't want us getting any benefit the right from the sun and for the right duration, sun gazing can actually strengthen the eye muscles and improve vision. Sun gazing can also be a form of meditation a time to center oneself and find tranquility amidst the hustle and bustle of everyday life. The simple act of focusing on the sun can help quiet the mind, reduce stress, and promote a sense of well-being. To wrap it all up, sun gazing can offer a multitude of benefits. From improved mental health through increased serotonin and melatonin levels to a sense of invigoration from absorbing the sun's energy, it can also potentially enhance eyesight and serve as a form of meditation, providing a tranquil moment in our often hectic lives. As with any practice, it's essential to approach sun gazing with care and respect. Always remember to protect your eyes and never push beyond your comfort level. So, the next time you see the sun rise or set, why not pause for a moment and bask in its golden light? You might be surprised at the benefits you reap. Yeah, amazing. Have you ever Very practical. Uh, video there about sun gazing. Now, what I wanted to say quickly is when they're talking about at sunrise and sunset, it's because because it's moving, you know, if it's coming towards you and it's coming up, well, it's whatever distance as you, I can't work it out because it's, it's, on, it's on a fictitious horizon line. It's an apparent horizon line. It's not a fixed point. It's not a globe. The horizon is always at eye level because it's non-fixed. It just seemed, it's just where the, the sky and the water or the earth meet, yeah? So it's hard to, to, to say how far away the sun is at sunrise and sunset, but it's at the same place. It's just about to get, if it's going away from you, it's going to angular size reduction to a point where it looks as though it's gone downwards, but it's gone away from you. And then also at sunrise, when it's coming towards you, it's at that same point. Because it's at that same point. So it's the distance that the sun's away from your point, you, where you're standing, is safe for the eyes. Okay, that's what they're saying. Okay, let's just just sort of get that out there. So I know 
we're all on the same page. Right, so let's have a read of this. Nine amazing health benefits of sun gazing. Increased melatonin and serotonin. Improves quality of sleep. Fatigue fighter. Improves dream recall. Increases pineal gland size. Boosts energy. Improves eyesight. Helps seasonal affective disorder. Improves endocrine health. I mean, this is all for nothing. And this is why they don't want you looking at it. And this is why they want to block it. Because of climate change. Yeah? Because they don't want us evolving. They don't want us getting any benefits from it. Satan doesn't want us to be healthy and live long and happy and spiritual lives. Quote, we are constantly looking for new ways to improve health and treat specific ailments. An endeavour that takes us around the world and to many different cultures. During one of those quests, we came across the process of sun gazing for improved health. It may sound like an unusual health treatment. However, it is actually considered to be one of the most effective therapeutic activities. What is sun gazing? Sun gazing, a practice also known as sun eating, is a strict regimen of a gradually allowing sunlight into your eyes at specific periods of the day. The goal when implementing the practice is to look into the sun at periods of the lowest ultraviolet index, which occur at when it's at a certain distance. No sunrise and sunset. There is no sunrise and sunset. It's just get, getting away from us or it's coming towards us. The practice follows specific guidelines to render the most benefits to limit dangerous exposure. The practice is also known as the HRM phenomenon, a term that the practice received after Hira Ratan Manek submitted himself to NASA for testing. And we're going to look, look at a short video about Hira Ratan Manek, okay? Research suggested that Manek actually did possess the seemingly superhuman ability of not eating. <clears throat> With regular practice following a strict regimen over a period of approximately nine months, many practitioners report losing the need for food and sustaining on energy from the sun. So can you imagine if we lived in a culture where we didn't need to eat? Because some, some of the spiritual holy men say that eating food is just an addiction, it's just a drug. And it's just the physical body wanting it rather than the higher self, because the higher self doesn't need to eat. So carrying on. What are the benefits of sun eating? In essence, sun gazing provides beneficial stimulation to the body. The process itself negates the body's innate need for food and uh, retrains it to run on the energy of the sun. As such, the process helps increase energy, clarity of thinking and overall health. NASA research suggested that the process could make an individual maintain a level of health that was far better in comparison to other individuals of the same age. The process has also been shown as an effective treatment for specific conditions. Melanoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and a number of other cancers benefit from the treatment. Likewise, the increased vitamin D gained from the process is a known healing agent. How do I start sun gazing? Following the specific process for sun gazing is crucial to prevent sun damage. The process involves a nine month practice which is typically broken into three phases. Zero to three months, three to six months and six to nine months. After the initial phase, you'll continue excuse me, walking barefoot for 45 minutes daily for the rest of your life. To begin, select a safe period of the day, sunrise or sunset, and gaze at the sun for 10 seconds. Continue consecutively adding 10 seconds a day. Be sure to stand on the bare earth and look straight into the sun. During the first three months, you'll notice mental depression subside and an increase in balance of body and mind. I mean, if, if it was in today's culture, could you imagine every morning with the kids? Right, we're all going to go and gaze at the sun for half an hour this morning, children. He did that every day. Continue daily gazing at the sun, adding 10 seconds each day through the next phase, and you'll experience the curing of physical diseases. Progress in the last phase, six to nine months, continuing to gradually increase the amount of gazing to 44 minutes. Once you have reached 44 minutes, begin walking barefoot on the earth for 45 minutes daily. Complete this practice for a total of six days straight at a period of the day when the earth is warm and the sun shines on your body. This period is when you'll realise the full effects of the practice. To maintain the benefits of sun gazing and to boost the immune system, continue the practice of walking daily. The process is illuminating and enlightening as a potential for increasing health in superhuman ways. To find out more from people who have been sun gazing for years, continue reading below for feedback from our readers. And this is www.earthclinic.com. Go to it. Read some more if it interests you. Right. Sun gazing. Let's have a listen to this. This is the documentary part one. This is a Western guy who has started sun gazing and what he has to say about it.
all you've got to do is look at it. It's not asking a lot, is it? Let's start helping ourselves, guys. Nobody else is going to do it for us. Hi, I'm Matt Wilcox. I'm 25. I'm from Anaheim, California, currently attending Maharishi University in Fairfield, Iowa, and I am a sun gazer. Could you uh, just... just look at his countenance, how serene he looks, how his smiling eyes and his smiling face is at peace. He's spiritually awakened. His pineal glands opened. He's, you know, at ease with himself. Tell us a little bit about what, what sun gazing is. Well, basically, um, it is what it sounds like. You gaze at the sun. Um, you do it during certain periods of the day when it's safe, though. Oh, the sun is great day to look at. You, you, you lose your vision. You can go blind or whatnot. It's not good to look at it because it could get dangerous. Why is that? Because of the ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet rays. The UV, the UV rays, I was told that. Um, are you aware that there's no UV rays within 45 minutes of it rising or setting? Didn't know that. I wasn't aware of that. No. Okay, let me correct myself and make one thing very clear. Most of the time, between 45 minutes of the sun rising or setting, the UV index is at zero. But sometimes it still can be low. So, if so the UV index, if it's saying at 45 minutes and it travels at a thousand miles an hour, right, that's three quarters of a thousand, which is 750. So the sun is about 800 miles away. So if it's, it's from 800 miles away and more, it's safe to look at. But once it gets past that, nearer to you, then the UVs, UV rays come into consideration. It's always recommended to check the UV index before you gaze. All right, so it's 8.15 p.m. At 8.05, this was updated. UV index is zero. Sunset, 8.28 p.m. Well, like I say, no I've looked at it when it sits its eyes in the sky. looking at it no matter what time it is, if it's not comfortable... Don't look at it. Use your instincts. Explain to us from step one, or step A to Z, like what is what is it that you do when you sun gaze? What you do is you gaze at the sun with the bare feet, and you start with 10 seconds your first day, 20 your second, 30 your third day, and so on, up to 44 minutes. You work your way back down from 44 minutes, you take off 10 seconds, back down to 15 minutes, and from there you can do it for 15 minutes um, whenever you'd like. When you're done sun gazing, the ideal thing is to close your eyes until the image goes away, or cover your eyes until the image goes away, and that's about it. All right, now how long have you been sun gazing? Today will be 12 minutes and 50 seconds that I'll be staring at the sun. And you progressively go up 10 seconds every day. Yeah, 10 seconds every day that I sun gaze. Yes. Are there, what are the benefits? Well, um, sun gazing has many benefits. Um, other than the fact that it just feels so good. Um, it has it has health benefits. Um, Look at a smile on his face. And it has been... Listen to the contentment said to be in his voice. This is what being spiritually connected does for you. It makes you a, um, a better human being. My soul a happier human being. Sun gazing. And, I think and we sun all deserve that, don't we? To me. I think that it really finds you. Uh, to your knowledge, is there any anybody out there that you've known to have sun gazed and become enlightened? Are there any stories? The most famous sun gazer um, is alive today. We'll be looking at him um, next. He goes by the name of HRM, and you can look him up. They did a study on him where they watched him day and night for 411 days, and he did not eat. He only drank boiled water. All his vitals were fine. His body was fine. The only thing that they found was that his pineal gland 
was larger than the average person. I wanted to know what was going That's on. That's why they want to cut us off spiritually to stop us accessing it and using so it. So I decided to consult with Dr. Travis and get an EEG on me. So my name is Fred Travis. I'm director of the Center for Brain, Consciousness, and Cognition here at Maharshi University of Management. So, um, what are the results of my EEG? So what we did is we looked at what your brain was doing when you were just looking at another object, looking at the tree, and then looking at the sun. The dots that we're seeing are where the brain waves were recorded. So when you had all the sensors on your head, there was a line between the dots if those parts of the brain are working together. So this is when you're looking at the tree. What you're seeing is the frontal areas are mostly active because the perceptual field is relatively it's not changing, it's not very important. Let's look what's happening when you're looking at the sun. What we're seeing again, it's the frontal areas are still active, but there's much more, especially here in the lower end theta, in terms of the focus is much deeper, is much stronger, and also here um, on the level of gamma. And notice it's not only in the front, but also there's quite a bit of activity in the back. The whole brain has become a little bit more activated. Now the overall impression you see here is there's much more coherence. It's, it's more red. That means there's much higher coherence when looking at the sun. Specifically, look again here at the gamma, fast frequencies between almost all parts that we measure. It's just the whole brain, the gamma activity is much higher. The attention is much more on the object. Also interesting here in the theta, there's increased focus and also this is the two alphas notice alpha 2 has much more coherence when looking at the sun so pretty much to sum it up um, more brain was used while looking at the sun compared to looking at a, an object farther far away like a tree yeah. yeah while knowing what's going on in my brain while i'm sun gazing was very interesting i still have one important question to tackle is there a way i can safely look at the sun or have my eyes been damaged? I decided the only way to truly know if my eyes have been damaged or not is to get the most thorough eye exam possible by some of the best doctors in the country. So I headed to the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics to the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences where I was helped by resident Dr. Christopher Watts and Dr. Tim Johnson who are both ophthalmologists. We'll leave it there because that's the end of the video there. But I doubt if there's anything wrong with his eyes, or otherwise you would have, you would know, wouldn't you? You know with your eyesight if it's going or there's something wrong with it. You don't need to go to a doctor to tell you if it's right or not. You know yourself. So let's have a listen. <coughs> Look at Hira Raten Manek, the guy who didn't eat anything for 411 days. This is just a short video of him talking about sun gazing. Because for general people, you know, to know the practice within a few minutes. Mm -hmm. So sun gazing is a very easy practice. You have to just look at the sun during the safe hours of the sun, that is within the first hour of the sun or last hour of the sun, when there is no, where there is no ultraviolet. And it brings in photons of energy which reach the brain, energize the brain, give better health to the neurons and according to your comfort and convenience whenever possible you just try to do sun gazing and build up the time. When you have reached about 10 minutes of sun gazing by 60 days of practice you get better health of the eye. When you are at about 90 days of practice 15 minutes you get perfect mental health and mental peace. When you are at 6 months, 180 days, 30 minutes of sun gazing, you will be free from physical problems. And when you are at 9 months, 45 minutes, 270 days of practice, your body will become a sore asthma 
And this practice can be done sometimes morning, sometimes evening. You can be regular, you can be irregular. Just try to do whenever it is possible. If you are in a tropical climate, you can complete it within 9-10 months. If you are in a cold climate, this practice may get spread over little longer. And for further details, you can refer to uh, www.solarhealing.com. You can email questions. Email ID Hira H I R A R A T A N M A N E K at yahoo.com and, <laughs> and, and I always reply the questions. Uh, so that's a, a practitioner of sun gazing, but we're going to look at uh, somebody who didn't eat anything for 70 years. A holy man aesthetic in India. Let's have a look at this. It's uh, an amazing video and this is an amazing, this is a spiritual practitioner. You have to be a spiritual practitioner in order to get your body attuned to living off the ether and from the sun because it's all the same thing. It's all electromagnetic. We're electromagnetic magnetic beings. We're in, a, in an electromagnetic world, realm, with an electromagnetic sun. So we all feed off each other. We're all part of the same energy. We're all vibrating. Aside from the controversies in the Vanner case, there was another study conducted in India in 2003 that bafflingly seems to confirm the phenomenon of pranic feeding. It was conducted on a yogi who claims he has neither eaten nor drunk for decades. But what is behind these incredible accounts on the internet? This is just a man who's using his human potential, his God-given human potential. We can all do what he's done if we choose to do so. It's up to you. Of course, I'm free will is a bitch. Mysterious yogi, and I get the rare opportunity to film him in his native village. Mataji Praladiani normally lives in a cave in the mountains, but once a year. He visits his family to celebrate the holy Navratri festival. Here the yogi is worshipped as a holy man who had a vision at the age of seven and allegedly hasn't had a bite of food or drop of water since. So <laughs> Ja, also 60 Jahre ohne Wasser und, und, und ohne Essen und ohne Energie, das glaube ich schlicht und einfach nicht. Das ist denkunmöglich. Ich habe es mir abgewöhnt zu sagen, das gibt es nicht, sondern ich sag eigentlich nur mehr, ich kann mir das nicht vorstellen. Es gibt in Indien ja, eine richtige Tradition diesbezüglich von Menschen, die ohne Nahrung leben. Das, was auffallend ist und was sich wie ein roter Faden durch alle diese Geschichten zieht, da sind... Behauptungen von Einzelpersonen. Und es gibt keinen einzigen objektiven Nachweis. Natürlich, wenn in so vielen Traditionen solche Berichte existieren, warum sollten die alle gelogen sein? Das ist ja völlig unrealistisch. Na ja, gut, dann wäre es ja interessant, dass man dann sozusagen, weil sie vier, fünf, sechs Leute zusammenfindet, die eben vertrauenswürdig sind und die könnten ihn dann beobachten. Ne? Dr. Sudhir Shah, I am director of neurosciences at Sterling Hospital, a city-based corporate hospital of a very high station. So one doctor telephoned me that he is aware of a person, that is Prala Jani, who is not eating, not drinking anything 
for nearly 64 years. Uh, I mean, I was very skeptic to what all he said, and uh, I laughed it out. I said, uh, I think it's unbelievable. I Listen, there's a good chance somebody's trying to hack your website right now. You really? gotta make sure. Doctor, I mean, what are you talking? Have you, have you got any evidence for that? You know, Roksha, I'm just telling that uh, these people have brought him to me and I know this Madhari for some time and if you would like to study, I can ask him to see you. One day he came to my office and uh, said that, yeah, okay, I'll allow you to investigate, but nothing amazing should be done in my body. I said, uh, you will have to be in the hospital under continuous uh, video monitoring. And uh, if you are true, I will put your good remarks to the world. If you are wrong, I will have to literally undress you. In the sense, uh, this is cheating. If you are prepared, then come. So Dr. Sudesha approached me regarding this Mataji and for the medical science this is uh, not possible. I was so hopeless to begin with that I thought that it would not continue for more than 24 hours. The project of Trilla Jani or Mataji to prove that he is not taking anything. He is not taking food, not taking uh, water, not passing urine and not passing stool. This had to be proved only physically. You have to keep a watch on him and it could be proved. So it was constantly observation under uh, my supervision. All the security personnel was, was uh, from the hospital side and it was a camera observation. I started my mind that he uh, is cheating and this is not going to continue. So from day one only, I took all possible measures to see that he is not left alone for a moment. We went on changing the security, we went on changing the cameramen so that they cannot make any problem. We went on putting two cassettes simultaneously so that even while changing the cassettes, he may not pass urine. At the end of the project, our conclusion was Mr. Prahlad Jani did not take anything orally, neither fluid, nor water, nor food during these 10 days of our I'm project. not surprised. Number two, Mr. Prahlad Jani did not pass urine or stool during these 10 days, although we could see formation of urine in his bladder, which was reabsorbed from the bladder. I was doing his sonography twice a day for seven days, morning, evening, morning, evening. And there was ups and downs. One time it is a 400 ml, then 200 ml, 300 ml urine. But at the end of the study, gradually, there was no urine in his urinary bladder. He was claiming that he is absorbing the urine in his body. Which Amazing. Was difficult to explain as far as the science is. This concerned. is what a fully functioning is, human being I does, and we all have it. included complete blood count, ESR, renal function test, endocrinal test, Makes a lifestyle function choice. test, and all to make a lot of sacrifices, including whole body CT scan. The present part was in all this material his reality more, that we live in. Morphologically, his test was clear kidneys, liver, spleen, everything was normal. Everything was normal and there was no even changes because of the age. I mean, all possible things that could be done non-invisibly in this hi-fi corporate hospital with the help of so much involved consultants who are all, most of us are trained abroad also. And we were just scratching our head as to, as to well, it's not that difficult to understand why he can do it. Just go look at his spiritual practice. But scientists don't want the spiritual. It, it blows their little pseudo world apart. They don't like it. It's too illogical for them. Meine Vorstellungskraft und ich habe das jetzt gerade das erste Mal gesehen und es hat ja also wenn sie mir das so erzählt hätten, hätte ich gesagt, ich glaube es nicht. Er hat über zehn Tage weder uriniert, noch hat er Stuhl unter sich gelassen, noch hat er... Ich habe nicht gemacht, 64 Jahre, aber nur 10 Tage. Und es gibt Befunde 
von ihm, man würde sich erwarten, Jesus. dass die harnpflichtigen Substanzen haushoch sind. Das ist eine absolute Bombe. Yeah, absolutely. But that's the innate potential that we have within us, within, within all of us, guys. That's the potential that we have. He's just an ordinary man who's chosen to live his life in a particular way. Right, this is a great video. This is a young guy in America talking the truth about sun revealing all the lies we have been told. This young guy here is very impressive and, and really impressed me when I watched this video. Listen to this. How many of y'all heard that when you were younger, if you look into the sun, it might blind you. So don't look into the sun at all. How many of us have never looked up at the sun and even tried it because we heard that? I know I was one of those people. There's a reason that they, when I talk about they, you have to understand that Satan runs the earth and all the information that's put out to the human population for uh, mass consumption is put out by Satan and his followers. And I'm not religious, I'm not, I'm not none of that shit, I'm not at all, I'm spiritual. But the truth just is what it is. When you look at who runs earth, or when you look at the Bible, mind you, I did not know this until just recently, but in the Bible they talk about how um, Satan was cast to hell, right? He was cast to hell to uh, be there forever, him and all his followers, right? In the Bible it says, Satan was cast unto the earth. It doesn't say hell, it says the earth. The earth is hell. This is the place that he was cast to. And when we come onto the earth, right? You're supposed to live a life. You're supposed to grow. You're supposed to learn. And you're supposed to ascend. You're supposed to, you're not supposed to keep reincarnating to earth over and over and over and over again and never remember your past lives. You're supposed to remember your past lives. But what they do, we get here, right? And they get us confused and they get us distracted by all the shit that's going on. You talk basketball, football, baseball, uh, liquor, drugs, uh, movies, you know, uh, for men, it's the women. They distract you with the women. For the women, they distract you with the men. You see what I'm saying? It's a whole bunch of distractions and we don't even know why we're here. But the point is to ascend. What is one of the main things that will help us ascend? Looking into the sun. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff that people do to increase or get into their spirituality. But the sun, looking into the sun, it accelerates everything. If you look into the sun one night, right? The most spiritual thing you could do is get involved with your dreams, with your inner being. You look into the sun um, during sunrise or sunset because it's going to be bright and it'll be uncomfortable your first time. But you look into the sun one time, that next morning... Guarantee you remember your dreams and remembering your dreams is key because that's how you remember your past lives In all of your dreams, right? You're normally yourself. You're in the body that you're in right now, but In a dream about your past lives, you're gonna be in a whole nother body You'll be in a whole nother vessel and you'll know the whole life story of that vessel But first you got to start to remember your dreams So look into the Sun and every time you remember a dream you have to write it down and you'll start to remember more and more and more Amazing video It puts a smile on my face listening watching young young people like that uh, Talk like that He's another old soul in a young body and they've all come here to help humanity beat Satan and to bring God back into our lives. That's what I believe. And that's an old soul in a young body, trust me. So let's move on to, that's why this man here, Mr. Bill Gates, wants to spray dust into the atmosphere to block out the sun. Only Satan would want to do that. And his little helper, Bill Gates, is trying to do it. And what I want to know is, an unelected official like this man is allowed to do whatever he wants. Because he's high up in the pecking order. He's one of Satan's little henchmen. All that money that they say he has doesn't belong to him. He's just a front man for it. He can just have as much as he wants. He can only spend so much anyway. It all belongs to Satan. And they're front men. Same as Jeff Bezos. 
same as uh, Richard Branson and all these types. It doesn't belong to them. It belongs to Satan, same as the Rothschilds and the royal family. All that stuff doesn't belong to them. They just It's something to stick a label on it. Oh, it belongs to them. It doesn't. It belongs to Satan. It all belongs to Satan. And he's just doing Satan's fucking bidding. Why else would you want to block the sun out? If not, to retard us, to stop us, to halt us. So let's have a look at this video of how stupid Bill Gates' idea is. Being super clunky corporate software. What you didn't realize is that Bill Gates doesn't think of himself that way. Bill Gates doesn't think of himself as some guy who got super rich making bad software. Bill Gates thinks of himself as God in control of the solar system. And that's why Bill Gates is now backing something called sun dimming technology that would reflect sunlight out of the Earth's atmosphere, causing global cooling. Ooh, that's not fraught with risks. <laughs> He's not gain of function yeah. research. Reason climate change is a reason to do this that. shit. But that doesn't stop Harvard but University. It's not the re- the re- reason why they're doing it, is it? Or wanting to do it. By spewing calcium carbonate dust into the atmosphere. Bill Gates is backing the first high altitude experiment of one radical climate change solution, creating a massive chemical cloud that could cool the earth. It's called But they're already doing this. And it's see it every day. It would look Just look up in the sky. Thousands of planes would fly very high and use nozzles to inject millions of tons of light reflecting particles into Like they're not doing it already. It would create a thin chemical cloud of those particles around the whole planet, blocking some sunlight from reaching the surface. It would mimic a giant volcanic eruption, which we know cools the earth. Now just to restate, Bill Gates is not God. Bill Gates is some kind of weird socially awkward rich guy who lives in Seattle. He doesn't own the planet. But he's now changing the planet single-handedly. This is not just over his yard in Seattle. This is over your yard and our oceans and the whole planet. Now, according to Forbes, Frank Kutch, who is the project's top investigator, quote, does not know what the results might bring. Just experiment with the globe and find out what happened. It's cool, though. He's a billionaire. Michael Schellenberger is the author of Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All, which it does. Our rivers and oceans get dirtier and no one notices. Uh, Michael, it's great to see you tonight. Thanks so for having me, Tucker. It's a little alarming to think that someone as myopic and out of touch and totally ideological and weird as Bill Gates thinks he's in charge of the planet. What should we be worried about here? I mean, basically everything. I mean, when I first heard about this uh, many you know, over two decades ago, this was a thought experiment. But this is real. They're really trying to do this. They've, they've encountered opposition every step of the way. I've co-authored uh, articles with the, with the Harvard investigator. Uh, we've told him personally this is a terrible idea. The vast majority of scientists disagree with this. You have to remember what they're proposing to do is identical to what we feared would occur after nuclear war in the 1980s, which is nuclear winter. The idea is that you cool right. the planet deliberately. The effects on crops are completely unknown. They call this an experiment, but they know that there is no way to figure out what the large-scale planetary effects of this kind of thing would be. It's grossly irresponsible. They know for a fact that they will never get international agreement on this. So they're basically trying to socialize the idea, normalize the idea, make us comfortable with an idea that should make us extremely uncomfortable. Yeah, a guy who cuts his hair with garden shears is now trying to control the solar system. The funny thing is, anyone who notices this, that maybe Bill Gates has outsized control over our lives, is immediately denounced by Snopes or one of these fraudulent fact-checking sites as a conspiracy nut. Do you think you're a conspiracy nut to have concerns about Bill Gates' hubris and ambitions? No, I mean, this is, uh, this is bonkers. I, I mean, honestly, there are very few people, when you talk to them privately, that think this is a good idea. There's a lot of people that are very scared to speak out publicly because Bill Gates' influence is extraordinary. He's a massive philanthropist. I think his intentions are very good. Nobody doubts his well intentions. No, they're not. But good intentions can lead to some very bad things. No, they're not. The amount of hubris and arrogance He's just doing as he's been told to. We're talking about millions of farmers around the world who will be affected by this. How will they be consulted? What is the idea for how this is going to be governed? There is no plan for governance. There is no way to get agreement on this internationally. They know this. You know, Tucker, the thing is, the trends on climate change, most people don't realize they're going in the right direction. The United States has reduced its carbon emissions. 
by, by you know, more than any other country over the last 20 years, we've had an extraordinary success in the United States in reducing our air pollution. And now we're, now we're faced with the prospects of this radical experiment. If there's one thing we could do to improve our country overnight, it's tax, tax exempt nonprofits. People like Bill Gates make billions. They die, but they continue to distort our society with these tax exempt foundations. We should tax them immediately. Pay the rate we pay. <laughs> We'll leave it at that. We took a course, and, and that's just the absolute madness of what Bill Gates wants to do because he has what we call an ulterior motive. And the definition for that is a secret purpose or reason for doing something. He's got the real orders from Satan above, and then they go, we'll make up an excuse so we'll, get, we'll invent climate change, and, the, and then say, oh, we've got to, because the planet's going to overheat. Notice the two things I want to get rid of. Carbon dioxide, and we're a carbon-based life form. 800,000 years ago, it was like 700 parts per million. That's why we had giant people walking around, giant trees and everything else. But it's slowly been reduced and reduced and reduced. It's at 0.04% at the moment. If it goes below 0.02, everybody's dead. Everybody's dead. And that's why they want to get rid of this, or block the sun and lower the carbon. Because it's good for us. And Satan doesn't want what's good for us. He only wants to make us just about livable enough to, and easy enough to control. Right. Told you that one, didn't I? Ulterior or reason hidden or secret. Of a reason hidden or secret. A secret purpose or reason for doing something. Ulterior motive, reason and purpose. And the ulterior motive is the retardation of us on a spiritual level and a physical level and all levels. Slow development or development that is slower than it should be. And that's exactly what they're trying to do to us by lowering carbon and trying to uh, uh, take the sun out. But the chemtrails are doing it already. They're doing it already. Because they know that the sun is going through, it comes through phases where we really benefit from it and they don't want us anywhere near it. No, you're locked in your house all day. Retardation, the process of making something happen or develop slower than it should, which takes us away from our spiritual self, which then takes us away from God. That's how they're doing it. And it, 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 it robs us of our potential. That holy man that you saw there was only showing you his, the potential that we all have within us. He's decided to live in his life in a certain way, to pray, to meditate, and live a holy life. But that is in turn given him, I don't know how old he is. He could be twice the age of what he said he is. Because they live very, very long lives as well. See, but would you really want to tell everybody in the modern, coming into a city, how old you really are? They'd never let you out of the hospital. So you might be just thinking, well, we'll do the eating thing. But we don't know. But that's the potential. All he's doing is living at his full of potential. And we can all do it. Possi potential possible when the necessary conditions exist. Potential, someone or something's ability to develop, achieve or succeed. All it takes is to you to want to do it. There are sacrifices involved. That man who doesn't have a wife, he doesn't, he, he doesn't have a sex or anything like that, the normal things. And they're very difficult to give up. <clears throat> I was celibate for four years. And it was hard. Literally. On all levels. Someone or something's ability to develop, achieve or succeed. That's what they're robbing us of. Which is leading to, you know, depriving us of our full potential of all God's children. All of us, because we're all God's children. Every single last one of us. With unlimited potential. And just to go over the, what's going to happen on the eclipse math, the 8th of April 2024, total solar eclipse. This is how it's going to go over America. Let's bring it up. There you go. So that's where it's at its most intense. Washington DC, New York, Toronto, Ottawa, Los Angeles. It's all going to get the, the, the more concentrated part. It's right in the centre. And some people are saying... But, you know, there's, it's a bad portent or things are going to happen and so on and so forth. So what I thought I'd leave us on is a quick look at this video. I'm just going to 
play it all depends on how much time we've got so I mean I can play you 10 minutes of this but we'll play this for watch this for 10 minutes just on what might happen on the 8th of April with this total solar eclipse Hi, this is George, and you're watching The Return of the King Channel. In April of 2024, the last of three eclipses to cross America will appear. The prophet Joel tells us the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Solar eclipses occur on a regular basis, so there has to be something more. In Revelation 22, 12, and 13, Jesus says this, he says, Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me, to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The path of the three eclipses form the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph, which in the Greek alphabet is the Alpha. The path of the first and last eclipse forms the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Tav, which in the Greek alphabet is the Omega. The eclipses now appear to be trying to tell us something, but there's more. The intersection of the first and last eclipse occurs in a location known as Little Egypt. Of all the countries in the world, why is the Alpha and the Omega, and now a reference to Egypt appearing over America? Because America was set up by the founding fathers for a very specific purpose. This is one side of the Great Seal of the United States, which can be found on the back of the $1 bill. Contained within the Great Seal is a prophecy of a new world order headed by a one-world leader, the one we call the Antichrist. It was in Egypt where God showed the nations of the world who the most powerful God was, the God of the Hebrews. God took his people out of the most powerful nation in the world at that time, Egypt, by defeating their gods. He then hardened Pharaoh's heart and caused him to pursue the Israelites. God parted the Red Sea and his people passed through safely to the other side. Pharaoh and his army entered the Red Sea and then God drowned them. None survived. America is the most powerful nation in the world. And just like in Egypt, where the people of God multiplied into a nation, Christianity grew mightily in a land that serves foreign gods. When the oppression by the Egyptians became severe, God took them out of Egypt. As the opposition to Christianity and its values grows, not just in America, but worldwide, God will take his people out just like he did in Egypt. The principalities and powers that rule over America have been summoned here by a hidden ruling elite. They are the same demonic entities as those that ruled over Egypt, the most powerful nation at that time. These demonic gods who rule the nations at the request of men will be defeated, just as they were in Egypt. Tom Horn, in his book, Zenith 2016, goes into great detail as to the purpose of America's founding, to lead the world in the creation of a new world order led by the Antichrist. Speaking of the Great Seal, he says this, The Great Seal of the United States is a prophecy hidden in plain sight by the founding fathers and devotees of Bacon's New Atlantis for more than 200 years, foretelling the return of a terrifying demonic god who seizes control of earth and the new order of the ages. The supernatural entity was known and feared in ancient times by different names, Apollo, Osiris, and even farther back as Nimrod, whom Masons consider to be the father of their institution. Our escape in Revelation chapter 12 is from the dragon, Satan, and his incarnate son, the Antichrist. Was the United States designed to produce the Antichrist? David Bay of Cutting Edge Ministries believes so. America was designated as the new Atlantis that would lead the world to the Antichrist. The original national bird envisioned by our Masonic leadership in the late 1700s was not the American Eagle, but the phoenix bird. This historic fact strongly suggests that at the right moment in world history, with the world entering through the portals of the kingdom of the Antichrist, America might suddenly be emoliated in fiery flames, burning to the ashes. Out of these ashes, the new world order would arise. 33rd degree Freemason Manly P. Hall, author of the book, the Secret Destiny of America, 
originally published in 1944, said this about America. Not only were many of the founders of the United States government Masons, but they received aid from a secret and august body existing in Europe, which helped them to establish this country for a peculiar and particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The great seal is the signature of this exalted body, unseen and for the most part unknown. And the unfinished pyramid upon its reverse side is a trestle board, setting forth symbolically the task to the accomplishment of which the United States government was dedicated from the day of its inception. It is 32nd degree Freemasons, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and then Secretary of Agriculture, Henry A. Wallace, that made the decision to place the great seal of the United States on the dollar bill. It is only the Freemasons who have achieved the title of 32nd or 33rd degree who are involved in the bringing of the New World Order to realization. Those at the 32nd and 33rd degrees of Freemasonry believe that in the Garden of Eden, it was the serpent Lucifer who wanted to enlighten Adam and Eve, and it was Yahweh who wanted to keep them in the dark. Their allegiance is to the dragon of Revelation chapter 12. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. This path here is the path of the solar eclipse that occurred in 2017. It occurred 33 days prior to the Revelation 12 sign. It is the 233rd day of the year. It is 133 days prior to the last day of the year. It begins in Oregon, the 33rd state. It ends in Charleston, South Carolina, which is located approximately on the 33rd parallel. Charleston is the location of the first Supreme Council of the 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemasons in the United States called the Mother Lodge of the World. This is the path of the third eclipse, the eclipse of 2024. The location where the two eclipses intersect is known as Little Egypt. The rituals performed by the Freemasons to deify the Antichrist are based on the rituals performed by the Egyptians to deify the pharaohs in ancient Egypt. It was in 1934, 32nd degree Freemasons, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and then Secretary of Agriculture, Henry A. Wallace, came up with the idea to feature the Great Seal of the United States on the dollar bill. Like 33rd degree Freemason Manley P. Hall, 32nd degree Freemasons FDR and Henry Wallace understood the secret meaning contained within the Great Seal. The idea of using the Great Seal on coinage or currency began with then Secretary of Agriculture Henry A. Wallace in 1934. Wallace got the idea after looking through a State Department publication titled The History of the Seal of the United States. Turning to page 53, I noted the colored reproduction of the reverse side of the seal. The Latin phrase Novus Ordu Seclorum impressed me as meaning the New Deal of the Ages. I was struck by the fact that the reverse side of the seal had never been used. Therefore, I took the publication to President Roosevelt and suggested a coin be put out with the obverse and reverse sides of the seal. Roosevelt, as he looked at the colored reproduction of the seal, was first struck with the representation of the all-seeing eye, a Masonic representation of the great architect of the universe. Next, he was impressed with the idea that the foundation for a new order of the ages had been laid in 1776, but that it would be completed only under the eye of the great architect. Roosevelt, like myself, was a 32nd degree Mason. He suggested that the seal be put on the dollar bill rather than a coin and took the matter up with the Secretary of the Treasury. He brought it up in a cabinet meeting and asked James Farley, Postmaster General and a Roman Catholic, if he thought the Catholics would have any objection to the all-seeing eye, which he as a Mason looked on as a Masonic symbol of deity. Farley said, no, there would be no objection. When the first draft came back from the Treasury, the obverse eagle side was on the left of the bill as is heraldic practice. Roosevelt insisted that the order be reversed so that the phrase of the United States would be under the obverse side of the seal. 
Here are FDR's initials, and here is where he requests the switching of the pyramid and the eagle. Well, I'm going to stop the video there, right, because it's going to run for far too long, so I'm on the two-hour mark already. But if you want to go back to the Rumble Solar Eclipse, April 8, 2024, the Rapture Antichrist Prophecy, US America. See, there's a whole esoteric side to, this, to the sun as well, guys. So, that's it. Let me just get the music back on. So that's it for this week, guys. Hope you enjoyed that. The sun, it's all, all pervasive. It's in our lives. It's part of us. We are part of it. We are part of this realm. We're all created by the Lord God Almighty. And we're looking at the benefits of the sun and how we can start doing some... Perhaps you might want to start trying some sun gazing. You might be in a place where you can do it quite easily. In Scotland, it's a bit harder because the days are mostly cloudy. So you've got to make the day, the, most of the days when it's sunny. But I do. And I've been doing it as often as I can. And it does have an effect. I can tell you that. So give it a go. Why not? You've seen the, the evidence for the benefits of sun gazing. It's not like you've got to go out and buy it. All you've got to do is look at it. But obviously in a safe way. If it hurts, don't do it. But if you feel okay, you, you can... Sometimes what I do is I, I wait till it's behind thin clouds and it sort of makes it... If I can look at it and focus on it, I will do. But you will know straight away. But give it a go. Why not? Well, that's it for this week, guys. I hope you enjoyed the show. I always do. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you all in the next video. God bless you all, guys.